Okay, let's start. So this is lecture 29. And um, we reached a certain point yesterday. I'll just remind you where we reached and we'll continue from there. <clears throat> so we were trying to calculate three diagrams in five four theory. <coughs> with the real scalar field and the diagrams were this and this and this and with momenta label like this all the diagrams and we concluded that the answer which we call im which is the function of all these momenta is equal to minus i lambda because of this diagram plus lambda squared by 2 I integral i of k1 plus k2 plus i of k1 minus k3 plus i of k1 minus k4. So it boils down to then calculating one single integral i and evaluating it for these three values. <coughs> Let me also say, uh, I said it in words yesterday but we can actually make it more explicit that actually these are four momenta k1 mu and k2 mu so this is k1 plus k2 mu but actually i depends only on the square of that the invariant square of that because it's lorentz invariant by construction and the only lorentz invariant you can make out of a single vector k1 plus k2 is its square square in the sense of four vector so it's actually that and we actually have names for these quantities. So for any two body to two body scattering process where the incoming momenta are uh, called K1, K2 and outgoing are called K3 and K4, uh, K1 plus K2 squared is called S, K1 minus K3 squared is called T and K1 minus K4 squared is called U. Now S is unique because it's the sum of the two incoming momenta T and U are not so unique because you could have interchanged the name of K3 and K4 uh, and that would interchange T and U. But there isn't anything that will interchange S with T and U. That's important to keep in mind. And so we want to calculate this quantity, I of S. Sometimes we call it I of P where P is the momentum. Sometimes we call it I of S. And what we did last time was to conclude that I, this time I think I, I call it I of P, and we concluded that this uh, is equal to. Um, so therefore, yes, yeah, sorry. Sir, uh, wouldn't K1 minus K3 be the U and? Normally, I believe K1 minus K3 squared is called T. Is it? So okay, maybe. It's hmm? a second diagram, right? Yeah, this one. This is the T channel diagram. This is the U channel diagram, at least how I learned it. Is yeah. there some reason why you want this to be the so U channel? Probably I have practiced. Yeah. Normally the vertical channel is called T and the cross vertical channel is called U, at least how I remember it. It's just a convention in anyway. Okay. So I of P is the integral. We did some combining denominators and we concluded that it's an integral uh, D for Q over Q squared minus delta squared, where delta is M squared minus P squared, I guess x1 minus x, as I remember. Did not get it wrong. 
Так. Yes. Minus p squared x one minus x. So this is p squared is where you have to put in s t or u eventually. So this is the integral. And now uh, this integral is supposed to be done over all of Minkowski space. We already diagnosed that it's divergent, but uh, before we uh, get to the <coughs> evaluation of it uh, and how we cut off the divergence, we'd first like to make this an integral over Euclidean space uh, because that's uh, better defined. And for this, we note something that has been obvious from the beginning that these denominators have poles. And so we have a pole at Q squared minus delta plus I epsilon equals zero. We've been forgetting this I epsilon all this time, but it's there and we bring it back now when we want to look at the exact location of the pole. So this is obviously where the pole is and it's a double pole. Now let's expand this out and so we get q0 squared, the zero component is q3 vector squared minus delta plus i epsilon and so the pole is at plus or minus, sorry, uh, I did something wrong, a plus delta minus i epsilon. I take this to the other side it's delta minus i epsilon and then q squared is q0 squared minus this and so this is the correct answer. Hmm? So there's a plus and a minus so there are two poles and each of them then gets doubled because of that square but where are they? Well let's assume q3 vector squared plus delta is positive that will be true if delta is positive and we are going to always work with delta positive. I did mention that well it could in principle be negative but uh, we'll simply work for delta positive solve everything and then we'll analytically continue if needed to negative values of delta so as long as delta is positive uh, this square root has a positive real part and a negative imaginary part so it sits here under the real axis and if you go take the negative square root then it has the opposite, negative real part and positive imaginary part. So it's, it's here. And the contour along which we are integrating Q0 simply runs along this axis from minus to plus infinity. Okay. So now we see <coughs> that uh, <coughs> we can use Cauchy's theorem in the following way. Unfortunately, I... some space here so so now we can use Cauchy's theorem for the following contour we are trying to integrate a function over a contour which goes from minus to plus infinity the integral of the same function over this contour is zero this is of course not the integral we want it's just a statement of Cauchy's theorem it says if I take any function whose poles are there and I integrate over this contour precisely where I understand that these ends are stretched to infinity minus and plus and here also plus and minus infinity then this whole thing integral is zero because there is no pole inside the integration contour. So this is zero. Because of that we have the following so integral so let's call this whole contour capital C the whole thing uh, so integral over the whole contour the q0 of this function with poles is equal to 0 and that means that the integral from minus to plus infinity dq0 plus the integral plus infinity to i infinity on a, on a arc 
plus the integral from i infinity to minus i infinity plus the integral from minus i infinity to minus infinity along an arc this is zero these are the four legs this is one leg second one third one fourth one the sum of these four terms is zero that's the statement that integral over the whole contour is zero i hope my labeling is clear when i say minus 2 plus infinity it's obviously this contour when i say infinity to i infinity well here's infinity and here's i infinity and it means along an arc which is very far away equidistant so in the limit you can take some fixed radius quarter circle and then take the limit as it goes off to infinity and then this one is down along the vertical axis and the last one is from here to here along a similar arc to this is zero now i'll argue that the arc integrals are separately zero because they are taken at magnet at uh, <coughs> magnitude of q0 which is now a complex variable but magnitude of q0 taken to infinity so let's look at the integral if q0 goes to infinity here i have dq0 and here i have q0 to the fourth so this thing falls off very fast at infinity and so the arc integral contribution to the integral is zero from both the arcs that finally means that this plus this is zero and of course this is an inconvenient one because it's going from plus to minus i infinity but i can reverse it and then say that this is equal to that so the integral minus infinity of to plus infinity dq0 of my given function is the same as the integral minus i infinity to plus i infinity dq0 of the same function and this is what is meant when we say we rotate the contour of integration hmm? the books will often just say we have a contour of integration we just rotate it because it's not hitting any poles the steps involved in rotating a contour are precisely these first you have a closed contour and find that it's zero argue that it's zero because of lack of poles <coughs> then you break it into its contribution from all the open contours then you drop the contours which are fully located at infinity this one and this one are fully located at infinity every point on them is infinitely far away you drop it by arguing that the integrand falls away, falls off at infinity and finally you get an equivalence between this contour and that contour and that's the statement of contour rotation okay clear good so let's apply it to that of course it's not nice to have a integral of a variable which i then take from minus to plus i infinity because i have to always remember that q0 is therefore imaginary all over the contour so i simply define q0 equals minus i q e where e uh, stands for um, um, euclidean okay so it's a new variable if q0 goes from minus i infinity to plus i infinity then q e goes from minus infinity to plus infinity <coughs> and now all i need to do is make the substitution there so d for q is equal to dq0 d3q this is equal from this relation to i dq e d3q okay i did nothing to the space parts of q only the time part became this and so the measure gave me a factor of i and this whole thing it's a bit of abuse of notation i'm going to call it d4 q e no look for a minus sign where is it dq0 you substitute q0 for minus iq e no no uh, dq0 uh, sorry uh, oh 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 sorry mm, yeah yeah sorry this is wrong uh, q0 is iq e thank you and let me just verify that yes qe is minus iq q0 is iq e so if q0 is minus i infinity then q e is minus infinity yeah yes and therefore everything else follows and now 
I just write my I of P. So this is an identity. I haven't really done anything. I've just exchanged one contour for another. Uh, so there's I, it's 0 to 1, dx. Then the measure is now d4 qe, which is d qe d3 q vector, 3 vector. And so together it makes a nice Euclidean 4 vector. Downstairs, my q squared is actually, remember q squared is q0 squared minus q3 vector squared, but this is equal to minus qe squared minus q3 vector squared. And this is uh, yeah, this is actually now my notation is getting a bit. Let's call this thing Q E zero hmm? for the time time component which is rotated. I'll keep the zero. This is a single variable. This is uh, these Q E is four different variables. Hmm? So Q zero squared. So it's minus Q zero E squared minus that. And this is minus the 4 vector QE squared. Yes? You're all clear? So we have to put Q squared there as minus QE squared. So there's minus QE squared. But the whole thing is squared. So both minuses go away. And here I get QE squared plus delta the whole squared. Okay, so now we have things in much better shape. It's a Euclidean integral and actually it's a kind of integral apart from its divergent property which we will address in just a few minutes. It's a kind of integral we like very much because it, although it's over a four vector, the only thing it, the integrand depends on is the square of that vector. So what sort of uh, coordinates, uh, just let's just check if this AC is on, it seems very stuffy in here. Huh? Broken. broken, I see. So I keep the door open. Won't really help. It. But it's not that hot somehow. It's uh, anyway. We will manage. It's the last time we are probably meeting here. Anyway, huh? So um, when we have a Euclidean space and the integrand depends only on the square of the whole vector, then we go to spherical polar coordinates. They are not completely the familiar ones. Familiar ones are in three-dimensional Euclidean space, r theta phi. Here we are in four-dimensional Euclidean space and it's momentum space, okay? But since this doesn't depend on those angles, there'll be three angles, uh, we can simply write d4 qe equals d mod of qe. This is uh, the radial component times q e cubed times d <coughs> omega. This is the solid angle uh, in, uh, it's a three dimensional solid angle. And I don't really care about how to break it up into angular coordinates because there's nothing to integrate it on. So I just want the integral of d omega, which as you know, in two dimensions, uh, in our usual solid angle, the integral is four pi. Here it will be something else. Okay, and we'll just write a formula for it. Now I'm going to put d omega in d dimensions, although actually d small d is now four. Hmm? Uh, but we'll need the formula for general d, so let's write it anyway. So the formula is we get from a maths book that the integral over a solid angle in d space dimensions is two times pi to the d by two over gamma of d by 2. And this is a, sorry? Shouldn't the small d be over 3 uh, dimensions? Yeah, uh, this is the, okay, so the definition is solid angle in 4 dimensions means th the 3 dimensional integral. So that's what the answer is in terms of the total dimension of the space. Okay, you could say that, uh, so, for, well, let's look at this formula. What happens if I put, uh, what happens if I put uh, D equals, uh, yeah, something I've done wrong here. So if we write D omega, D should be write it as D 
Well. No, uh, I'm going to use it for d equals uh, uh, four very shortly. Uh, but now I'm a little puzzled by the fact that about whether d should be four or three. Because if we put d equals to two, then yeah. it is something of the order pi, which is what we expect. Well, it's two pi. That's not the correct answer. I think d equals three gives me four pi. Huh? Giving four pi for d equals Yeah, because for d, see, d equals two, you get two pi. Huh? That's our theta plane. Okay, d equals three, you get two pi to the three half, but you also get gamma of three half, which I think is uh, root pi by two. Thank you. And when you combine them, you get four pi. And then d equals four, you get <coughs> this gives two pi squared. And that's the answer because gamma of 2 is 1. Okay, so this D means the space in which the angle is embedded. It's just a convention. Okay, good. Yes. Can you think here uh, what uh, for, for D equals to 1 where it's coming to? Yeah, you can. And the answer is very simple. In D equals 1, uh, a sphere is a pair of points because a sphere is always the space of all points of constant distance from the origin. In one on, on a line, if I pick an origin, the points of constant distance from the origin are just plus and minus r. So it's a it's two points. So you get two. Okay, uh, I think that's the reason. Good. Okay, now with all of this we can actually uh, proceed to do this integral until we reach a divergence. Now the interesting thing is that, uh, yeah, so this is the point and we can't proceed any further uh, without hitting a divergence. Remember, earlier we were manipulating the Q0 integral, that's not divergent, but the Q mod Q integral is divergent because this is the radial one. And with this, this is also mod Q e to the Q. Uh, everything now has been reduced to one variable called mod QE. Okay? And this integral is clearly divergent because it becomes I integral dx integral d mod QE mod QE cubed over mod QE squared plus delta whole squared. So this is of course divergent by the same scaling formula I mentioned yesterday. So it's divergent as long as I integrate from 0 to infinity. Now yesterday I said some words about the fact that this is an ultraviolet divergence because look, as long as delta is not 0, there's really no point uh, problem at 0. The problem is that magnitude of momentum equals infinity. That's high momentum. Okay. And um, well, if you think about it, uh, if space-time was discrete, if points could not actually coincide, then in the Fourier transform space, we would never have Q equals infinity. We would have cut off the short distance, uh, two points going to uh, very arbitrarily close, and effectively we would have cut off high momentum. So the problem is that high momentum, and somehow we have to cut it off if we want to make sense of this. Okay. So we'll simply do that first in the most naive way. We'll just put a number lambda there. Now we see a little bit why we did all these manipulations. Because earlier we had a four vector in Minkowski space, Q, E, Q. Then we converted it to a four vector in Euclidean space, Q, E. Then we converted it through spher spherical polar coordinates to just an integral over the mod of Q, E. This is the analog of R. This is the radial vector in this momentum space. Hmm. After doing that, we have only one integral to do, that is one variable to integrate, and that variable we integrate up to lambda. Okay, You know that if I did this in Minkowski space, it wouldn't have worked, because if I take the magnitude of a four vector in Minkowski space and try to cut it off, the individual components can still get very large. You know that in Minkowski space, the square of a four vector can be zero, it can be negative, it can be positive. Okay, so once we got to Euclidean space, a four vector square is always 
positive unless the vector is identically zero. So if I cut it off by putting lambda over here, then I really cut off the integral in a completely unambiguous way. None of the components can grow. And in fact, now this integral only has the radius vector in it, radius value in it, and that is fixed bounded between zero and lambda. And now this integral is doable. So let's do this part of the integral and put back i is integral 0 to 1 dx afterwards. Where is the x dependence? It's in delta. Nothing, delta is not doing anything. It's just sitting here as a constant while I do these manipulations. Later we have to integrate it. Good. So this integral uh, is equal to a half. So the standard formula, you can look it up and I've given the basic formula also in the notes. Lambda squared plus delta over delta minus lambda squared over lambda squared plus delta. That's the answer. Okay, and now we see the problem. If I try to take lambda to infinity, this term is okay, it just goes to minus 1. If I take lambda to infinity here, however, I get log of lambda squared and that's really the problem. Okay. So, <clears throat> good. So, let's try to uh, fix that um, in the following. So, let's try to first uh, understand the behavior of this answer for large lambda. Hmm? So, let's say lambda is large. What do we expect? Visibly, we can see that the divergence is like log lambda. That is exactly what I told you last time that it's a logarithmic divergence. This is what that means. It be, grows like log lambda. It's a slow growth, but it's still a growth. Hmm? So for large lambda, the leading term will be log lambda. And in fact, the leading term is just log lambda. Because if I take lambda very large, I can forget delta compared to it. And then this is log of lambda squared minus log of delta. But log of delta is finite log of lambda squared is twice log of lambda, two cancels half, so this is the actual leading behavior. Okay, good. Okay, uh, to be a little more precise, if we expand this, take uh, lambda large, write the leading term, and then write any sub-leading terms that may be there, which are finite for large lambda, and then we expect there will be terms which will go to zero at large lambda do a power series in 1 by lambda, we'll find that there's a constant term. For example, here there's a minus 1. So this times this is minus half. And of course, there's actually this delta here. So there's also minus half log delta. Okay. And let's, uh, and now the all the remaining terms I claim are of order 1 by lambda. You can just take lambda large and verify this. If you take lambda large, you take log of lambda squared plus delta, then you factor lambda squared plus delta as lambda squared into 1 plus delta over lambda squared. Then you use the summation of the property of the log, that it's log of lambda squared plus log of the other term, 1 plus delta over lambda squared and log of 1 plus x has an expansion in powers of x and all those terms vanish. All those terms go there. Okay. So let's just note the behavior of these three terms. This is divergent. This is finite and independent of everything. Independent of in particular p, the momentum that I was interested in. Okay, I'm trying to find an integral i of p, which is buried in delta. And this term is finite and p dependent. Okay, so there are three kinds of terms that I'm keeping. Divergent, finite and p dependent, finite and p independent. Alright, so let's just keep it there for now. And let's uh, plug this into the i of uh, into the amplitude and from this we conclude that i of p ah uh, so good so now uh, i think i did something wrong uh, there's still a d omega which i forgot to put here okay d omega 4 
I forgot to put that. That doesn't affect this discussion. It's just a finite factor. So let's find out that fine. Oh, there's another factor I dropped. Sorry, careless me. Uh, there was always 2 pi to the fourth, right? This was d4 q over 2 pi to the fourth times something. That also I dropped and that should be there. So with all that, we conclude that i of p with all those things is equal to, now I have 2 pi to the fourth and then integral d omega 4 is 2 pi squared. Not 2 pi whole squared, but 2 times pi squared. So if I divide that by 2 pi to the fourth, I get 1 over 8 pi squared. So i over 8 pi squared. And then here, I have to put those things, log <laughs> lambda minus half log delta minus half. And the rest are terms that vanish in the limit of large lambda. Okay, so although I haven't got around the problem of divergence, I've nailed it down to one particular term in the cutoff theory. This is a very useful step. Instead of just waving my hands and saying there's a divergent integral, I understand how it diverges if I cut off the theory. Hmm? Cutting off the integral is called regularization. Uh, let me just check. Ah, sorry, I keep forgetting things. Uh, here there is also integral in dx. Here also and here also there is integral in dx, but when it doesn't depend on x, then the integral in dx is 1, because x goes from 0 to 1. But here the integral needs to be done. Okay. So this result I am going to save in a corner, and I will make a few remarks. So i of p is equal to i by 8 pi squared log lambda minus i by 16. Notice I am quite careful about keeping numerical factors in front of all these terms. Hmm? Once I made a decision that my cutoff is lambda, then um, this is exactly right. When I say plus or terms of order 1 by lambda, this is exactly right. Now notice one interesting thing. If, if I chose lambda and you chose 2 lambda, should we argue about the choice? Both of them are momentum cutoffs, or you chose 10 lambda or 100 lambda. How will it differ in this answer? Constant. Uh, what is the constant? Supposing I choose 2 lambda, two log 2. That will add to this term. So we learn that this term, which is finite and independent of p, that term is uh, ambiguous. So although I am keeping it for now, uh, we'll see that actually it's ambiguous. This term, however, I won't be affected if I rescale my lambda unless I rescale it by a p-dependent factor, which I'm not supposed to do. Hmm. If I cut off my momentum, I shouldn't cut it off at a value which depends on what momentum I was scattering in the first place. That is, that's not the, I have to cut off my theory and calculate everything in the cutoff theory. Hmm. So I hope you appreciate the difference. So that's why this kind of term and this kind of term can be distinguished. This one will be ambiguous. This will not be ambiguous. This is not ambiguous. If I change lambda to 2 lambda, it's the same. I'll still get log lambda. You may wonder what if I change lambda to lambda squared. That I can't do because here I'm assigning that lambda has dimensions of momentum. So I have to call that thing lambda. If I call it lambda squared, then lambda has dimensions of root momentum. So this is log of whatever that thing is, which has dimensions of momentum. So there's, it's quite unambiguous. Hmm? Especially this term being divergent is important, and this term carrying the p-dependence is important. And actually this, as well as all other terms, are unimportant. Here I'll write plus order 1 by lambda. Okay, so I'm copying it upstairs. Integral dx log delta. And I'm not going to write any finite terms which are uh, independent of P, nor I'm going to write the divergent terms. Sorry, the, the terms which vanish in the limit of large cutoff. Good. Okay. Now there's an interesting question, what should I do with this next? Uh, but uh, I'm going to actually um, 
discuss something different which will be very useful uh, if any of you actually plans to do particle physics in any form and it's also conceptually very interesting and useful. I'm going to introduce another regulator which is different from cutting off the momentum but which will have a similar effect. It will give me a divergent piece, a finite piece depending on P and some ambiguous constant pieces. Okay, this other regulator uh, in the beginning people thought it was a stroke of insanity. This other regulator, so second regulator, so this is momentum cutoff regulator. Second regulator goes by the name dimensional regularization. And this uh, weirdly has the uh, has the definition that we continue the space-time dimension from four, which is the correct space-time dimension, to an arbitrary dimension d, which is very close to four. It's non-integer. Okay. Now it's weird because space-time is four-dimensional as far as we know. One time, three space. There's no we don't know what a fractional dimension could mean but if you look at this formula it can be perfectly well defined in fractional dimensions and I'll do it for you now and what we find is that uh, in terms of the deviation of d from 4 so I'll define 4 minus d as a small number epsilon <coughs> we'll be able to parameterize the divergences so it will be finite whenever d is not 4 and uh, it will diverge exactly when d tends to 4 now let me make a couple of comments. First of all, if d became smaller than 4, then you see that this numerator instead of being d4 q would be d d q where d is smaller than 4. This would not change because this is square because of we combine two propagators. That's the same in all dimensions. So this would actually visibly converge by my test yesterday of scaling all momenta. In d less than 4 it would converge. We have an extra piece of luck. It actually converges for any d, whether it's slightly less or slightly greater than 4, uh, because of the property of this integral, which can be done in terms of gamma functions, as we'll do now. Okay. So, fine. Uh, you may believe that it works, but you may still be asking, why did we think of this? What's wrong with the one that we worked with? Now, actually, the one that we worked with uh, has been used for decades, and it has worked pretty well, actually. But it has one fundamental problem. We are tampering with the momentum of the theory. We are saying that all momenta of the theory are cut off by a maximum value. Okay. Now, clearly, the idea of a maximum momentum violates special relativity. Because if I take two momenta, which are very large, and add them, momenta are conserved in special relativity. So P1 mu plus P2 mu is P1 plus P2 mu. And then I can get something which goes above my cutoff, but I am blocking that. Hmm? So, momentum cutoff violates special relativity. And this is bad because special relativity is the heart of the whole subject of relativistic QFT. The way it is, is because of special relativity. And we are ruining that one thing which we always relied on. Okay. So, it's not ideal. There's a second thing. Uh, in this course, I have been only able to discuss all these things for scalar field theory, 5 fourth. But supposing I had gauge theory, it turns out that this momentum cutoff also does, is not compatible with gauge invariance. And gauge invariance, as you know, is fundamental to the existence of the theory. It decouples some states and so on. Strangely, this regulator has no problem with both. Okay. Now, you may say, of course, that it has an obvious problem with special relativity because I'm no longer in 3 plus 1 dimensions. I'm in d minus 1 comma 1 dimension. But turns out that actually isn't a big problem. You can actually handle uh, Lorentz invariance or Euclidean invariance quite easily within this scheme. And you can handle gauge invariance within this scheme. Sorry. Yes. Uh, how, how do you define special relativity in like... Um, Fractional dimensions or yeah, yeah, yeah. So we we are going to do it in an example. 
But to really understand dim reg as this is known for short, you need to do a lot of study. I think to really learn dim reg would be equivalent of at least four to five lectures uh, to do. It's a lot of stuff. You may also ask questions like how do I define gamma matrices because someday I have to do fermions and what is gamma 5 and well people have spent years on that those problems but there is a satisfactory resolution and I think the clinching argument was the success of uh, I might have told you earlier that Hof and Weltman who got a Nobel Prize for it successfully renormalized Yang Mills theory and they did so using this and without using this nobody had been able to do it so this problem so renormalizing QED had been done but renormalizing Yang Mills theory had never been done before and their entire um, Nobel Prize winning work which was I think essentially the PhD thesis of Etof um, uh, is basically a discourse on how to use dimensional regularization to effectively cut off uh, in ultraviolet divergences in Yang Mills theory and even in spontaneously broken that means Higgs Yang Mills theory. So all the Yang Mills theories we need in nature were successfully uh, treated uh, using this regularization and no other regularization has been as far as I know anywhere near as successful. So uh, some of the reasons I'm just quoting for you I can't describe them here but there's a good reason to do this. So we are just going to do it. Okay. Once we agree to do it, things actually are quite simple. So what we'll do is that right from the beginning, d for q over 2 pi to the fourth will be replaced by d dq over 2 pi to the d. Remember, there's one 2 pi for every dq. This part of Fourier transform. So we'll do this. Okay, next we'll go to the Euclidean uh, description and so the d dimensional i of p, the thing I want to calculate will be, um, let's write it, 1 over 2 pi, uh, oh, let's start from this, from the beginning, i integral 0 to 1 dx integral now I'll do the contour rotation which doesn't care about the dimension remember that the contour rotation only involved the time part of it so we just pick one out of it and we don't worry about the fact that the rest of them are some fractional space dimensions and this as I said it's always to the two power the propagator is 1 by q squared minus m squared in every dimension scalar propagator so nothing changed there so this is what I have to change only this thing hmm? now it's quite straightforward you can practically guess many of the formulae in fact I can do it right here I have the formula here for four dimensions so what I'll do is this will be d minus one okay so I break my d uh, Euclidean momenta into the radial part and d minus one fractional number of uh, remaining directions and then this and I have to now use the formula for omega d that I showed you a few minutes ago where it didn't seem clear why I was showing it to you now I have to just use it okay with all this and oh there's 2 pi to the d which I keep forgetting that came as the denominator of the measure. Good. So it becomes this quantity, then becomes, well, it becomes that which becomes uh, i over 2 pi to the d integral 0 to 1 dx. integral d omega d so integral of that volume which we already know that ans the answer we wrote it earlier and then the integral q euclidean so um, okay let's write the mod sign to the d minus 1 d q euclidean this we now integrate from 0 to infinity we don't put any moment any cutoff on that and downstairs 
QE squared plus delta all squared. Okay. And now the omega d integral, we already had the formula and it is what? Um, why do I use formula when I need them? Yeah, but yeah, yeah, I, I actually also can remember it, but I'm disturbed when I can't find it. Huh. So this is 2 pi to the d by 2 over gamma of d by 2. Good. Okay. Well, most things seem to be under control. This is fine. This is fine. Integral dx will be always done last. And anyway, it only affects delta. So we better evaluate this integral. And for that, we have a nice identity. Integral y to the a over y squared plus delta whole square dy 0 to infinity is equal. So this we just look up in some table of integrals is delta to the a plus 1 by 2 minus 2 gamma function of a plus 1 by 2 gamma function of 2 minus a plus 1 by 2 upon 2. That's the answer of this integral. Uh, it's a special case of what is called the beta function, Euler beta function. Hmm? Uh, there's a function beta m n which is gamma m gamma n over gamma m plus n. And you can see this is gamma m gamma n over gamma m plus n because m plus n in this case is 2 and gamma of 2 is 1. So, but there's also a 2 from somewhere else, I forgot from where, but it's there. Okay, so this is the answer and using this, I get that my IP, I d dimensional integral of P is i over 2 pi to the d so let's keep track of all factors i has always been there 2 pi to the d is that guy okay then the result of doing the integral no first the volume element then uh, that factor so it turns out a plus 1 by 2 is just d because uh, this should be a and here it's sorry d by 2 because a is d minus 1 hmm? so it should be d by 2 so this is gamma of d by 2 the other one is gamma of 2 minus d by 2 and downstairs there should be a 2 and what happened there's a delta and what is this power this is also d by 2 minus 2 Mm -hmm. But that's inside the x integral. Delta to the power d by 2 minus 2. So that's the answer for generic d. Let's stare at it for a second and see what goes wrong if we try to hastily put d to be 4. Nothing wrong with this or this or this or this. But this one becomes gamma of 0. Gamma of 0 as you know is divergent. Okay. Also this becomes delta to the 0. Uh, which would mean that the momentum dependence would disappear. Okay, that can't be right. We are calculating a graph to find out its momentum dependence on the external momenta, but exactly at d equals 4, this goes away. And actually we know, this is where your intuition should come in, we know from the other regularization why this is appearing to go away, because it's not delta to the 0, it's really log delta. You know that log is something like intermediate between the power plus 1 and minus 1. Uh, so it's log scales, uh, it's different from the 0th power, obviously it's different from a constant, but it's sort of in bet intermediate between the growth and power growth and power fall off. So it's actually log, but <laughs> this is giving us a misleading answer if we blindly put d equals 4, yes. Sir. I don't understand, is it our formalism which makes 4 a bad number or is this a pure bad blood 
Uh, well, if I had uh, dimension 5 uh, or 6, for example, that would be bad also, right? It would be gamma of minus 1. Now, if I had dimension 5, I'm not sure what happens. Um, that I would have to think about. But uh, what is true is that 4 is giving me the logarithmic behavior. And that is, uh, that is something quite predictable by power counting, which you might have learned in QFT1. Okay, good. So let's continue. We've got somewhere. Now we need some, now what are we going to do? Well, we'll define the parameter epsilon as 4 minus d and consider the limit epsilon goes to 0. Ultimately, this is what we want to do. Sure, it's diverging when epsilon goes to 0, but we want to keep that divergence and look at it. We don't want to just say it's diverging and forget about it. So we do exactly what we did earlier with lambda. We kept the divergent term and the momentum dependent constant terms, but we dropped any terms which actually disappear in the limit. So in this case, we'll take the divergent terms and the PDP will do the same thing. So let's do it. So if I now look at um, this integral, uh, then I can simply write it as, um, so this becomes, it's quite easy and all the steps are in the notes, i times 4 pi to the epsilon by 2 minus 2 gamma of epsilon by 2. That is this one, right? Because 2 minus d by 2 is epsilon by 2. Hmm? And then integral dx delta to the minus epsilon by 2. Now you will say there are other terms, for example, 2 pi to the d gamma to the d by 2. But in all those terms, I just put d equals 4. Okay. So, and I cancel, most of them sort of cancel, and this is what I am finally left with. So, this is actually the answer for I of P uh, in, in D dimensions, but parameterized in terms of epsilon, and close to epsilon equals 0. And now my job is to expand around epsilon equals 0. Okay. So, for that I need, is this all clear? Please ask if there is any question for you. Okay, now my job is to expand and for that I have to expand the gamma function around its argument going to zero and something to a power where the power is going to zero. Okay, and here also there is something to the power. In fact, it's really 4 pi delta. I could as well write, rewrite this as i upon 16 pi squared and then put 4 pi delta here. To the minus epsilon makes my work a little easier. Sir, yes. Ah, uh, yes, you are absolutely right. So it is uh, what I wanted to write was delta by 4 pi to the minus epsilon. Yes, that is correct. Now the expansion of gamma of z, of any variable z, as z goes to 0, is 1 by z. Then there is a constant term, which is a very special number, gamma e, which has the value around 0 0.577. It's called, this, this e is not Euclidean, but Euler. It's actually the euler mascheroni constant. We don't really need to worry about where it comes from. It's just the number which is the constant part of gamma function, Euler gamma function, if we expand it around its pole at z equals 0. And then we get plus order z. Okay. The second identity is much simpler. If I have any number a raised to the power z where z is going to 0, then this is 1 plus z log a plus order z squared. Yes. So that is 1 by z, right? That's 1 by z. Okay. So the divergence for gamma as z equals to 0 goes as 1 by z. Yes. So the answer here will go like 1 by epsilon. Right. Okay. Yeah, it will. Okay, good. 
And if we put all this together, then we finally get a formula, which I'm going to write here, which is the dimension regularization formula for the same integral. It's also cutoff dependent and it is i over 8 pi squared epsilon minus i upon 16 pi squared 0 to 1 dx log delta upon 4 pi e to the minus Euler constant. Okay. If you see, log of this whole thing is log of delta minus log of 4 pi minus log of this, but log of this is minus, uh, is minus log of this is plus gamma e. And gamma e was here, which was here. So we just packaged it back into that. Okay, now let's, uh, so this is the answer. Okay, and then plus order epsilon, terms which are order epsilon which go to 0 as epsilon goes to 0. Okay, and so we have an answer and we see something very, very interesting. Of course, it took years for people to realize this, be this beautiful situation, but, uh, but you can now see it very neatly. Where there was log lambda, 1 by epsilon. Where there were finite terms, we have the, as far, uh, which depend on P, we have exactly the same finite term which depends on p, delta depends on p, and it's exactly minus the same coefficient, the same integral log delta. We have some extra terms which are just log of 4 pi e to the minus gamma e, which we never got in this way. But in this way, we also had a minus 1, which we never got in this way. But those are all ambiguities of the regularization scheme. Okay, and they are momentum independent ambiguities. So with log lambda being thought of as, this is a very loose connection. It's not that this scheme is the same as that scheme. This is the simplest answer you can calculate in both schemes. And it agrees as far as the divergent part and the finite momentum part. So divergent part agrees. And also P dependent finite part agrees. Okay. Yes. Uh, in the, if you see the above expression, you may conclude that the divergence is of order log lambda. Yeah. And from the lower expression, it's like 1 by epsilon. Yes. So, wouldn't that seem like how do we reconcile these two? It means that 1 by epsilon is like log lambda. They're two different okay. schemes completely. Okay. But experimentally, we see that 1 by epsilon. So, we see that the log divergence is in lambda, which we expected because lambda has the physical meaning of a momentum cutoff. We expected log lambda, we got log lambda. Okay. But we didn't know what to expect in this dimensional regularization scheme, but we get poles in epsilon. The general rule is that if you do more loops, more diagrams and all, you always get poles in epsilon. They could be simple poles, double poles, multiple poles but they are always integral order poles in epsilon. And that always has a nice implication in complex analysis. We like poles. So both are good in their own way. Okay, there's something else to be said, which is that lambda is a dimensional quantity. It has dimensions of momentum. Epsilon is a dimension less quantity. It's the difference between D and four. Okay, so it's a bit weird. In fact, it's a bit weird in the first place that we have log of delta. Why should we have log of delta, where delta is a dimensional quantity? Okay, and the answer is really, we can combine these two into log of delta over lambda squared. That answers the dimensional problem, right? Because delta and lambda squared have the same dimension. Delta is mass squared plus a p squared term. So it's dimension of square of momentum. So delta over lambda squared is good. Okay, so this combines nicely into minus i over 16 pi squared integral 0 1 dx log of delta over lambda squared. So this is satisfactory. Here the puzzle is much worse because here we have a log of delta and we never introduced anything with dimension to compensate that. So we have log of a dimensional quantity. 
and as you might know it really doesn't make much sense because it's ambiguous if I change the scale of measurement of that quantity okay but in this case we don't care if it's ambiguous because the ambiguity is already already there in the form of finite terms that don't depend on p and changing the scale of momentum will just give me more finite terms which don't depend on p so we don't mind uh, but we'll find a way to get around this tomorrow so right now we have not renormalized the theory we have regularized the theory that is all we have done is taken a theory with a divergent one loop diagram and calculated these diagrams in terms of a regulator keeping things very carefully and dropping only those things which disappear in the limit where the regulator is taken away hmm? so tomorrow we have to in the last and final lecture we'll try to see what physics can be extracted from these two results and uh, we'll learn quite a lot but we won't be able to get into uh, details because we don't have the time <coughs> but hopefully you will appreciate uh, what is the way to make sense of such a theory which is divergent questions yeah Right. Uh, so, if you look at the two equations separately, yes. How do we? So, in the initially, we saw by uh, some scaling arguments that the divergence should be logarithmic. Yes. But if I just look at the below, uh, the dimensional regularization expression. Yeah. Uh, like, how do I know whether it's logarithmic or it's like one by x? Like, how do you know which is the correct? Uh, one by you mean one by epsilon? Yeah, one by epsilon. Well, that's what came out of the calculation. We didn't know in advance. So, if you look at the, the lower expression, mm. wouldn't we conclude that the uh, that the divergence is like 1 by epsilon and not logarithmic yeah it's 1 by epsilon but it's logarithmic in lab it's logarithmic with respect to a momentum variable right okay right. It, it, this is there isn't a momentum variable here it's a different cutoff right. so this you see the point is that these okay tomorrow it will become a little clearer what to do in this case dimensional regularization to bring back a dimension into the problem uh, but uh, all that we can say at this stage is that there's a close analogy in that this i by 8 pi squared looks like it could be a physically meaningful number. We've actually calculated a number in spite of the thing being divergent. But what the number means I can only tell you tomorrow. Likewise, I claim this term which depends on log delta is physically meaningful including this coefficient but not including this 4 pi or e to the minus gamma or anything else, all the momentum independent. Those are not physical. Okay, but minus i by 16 pi squared integral dx log delta is a physical answer and that I have to convince you that physical meaning measurable even in principle. Of course, we don't exactly have a 5 4 theory in nature. It comes like the Higgs particle comes with a lot of other things. But if you did everything I have done, you could do it in quantum electrodynamics. There would be gauge <coughs> invariance, there would be gamma matrices, but you would get some answers for the four point scattering let's say of two electrons to two electrons and you could do them in both ways and it would have the same features and now you could actually measure these things 